When the Crocs co-founder first saw a prototype of the shoes back in 2002, the only words out of his mouth were, those are ugly. Somehow though, those ugly shoes created a multi-billion dollar publicly traded company and have been worn by celebrities and even on the runways of Paris Fashion Week. So how were three founders with zero experience in footwear able to build such a wildly successful shoe company? This is the surprising untold truth of Crocs. In 2002, Lyndon Hansen had hit a low point. He was sleeping on a friend's couch after separating from his wife. Around that same time, he also lost his job in computer hardware marketing and his mother passed away from cancer. His troubles seemed endless. George Bodecker and Scott Siemens were longtime friends of Lyndon and could see he desperately needed some cheering up. So they set up a sailing trip together around the Caribbean to try and clear Lyndon's head. Now, Scott was a quietly successful inventor and had made a good living developing and patenting products. And at the time of this trip was already semi-retired at 48. However, whilst they were on this sailing trip together, Scott asked Lyndon and George to try on a pair of rubber-like clogs he'd been developing after discovering something similar on a business trip to Canada. An early version of the shoe was created by a manufacturing company called Foam Creations Incorporated out of Quebec, and the shoes weren't rubber or plastic. In fact, they were actually a special resin that was odor and water resistant, slip resistant on a boat deck, and molded nicely to a foot. The only issue Scott saw in the design was that there was no back strap. So he'd added one himself and had high hopes that after finding investors, he could distribute this new version of the clogs in the US. He excitedly introduced his two friends to this new creation of his. However, despite Scott's confidence that these shoes would sell, his friends George and Lyndon were skeptical. The shoes were just so ugly. However, after some time spent actually wearing the shoes, which proved to be remarkably light and remarkably comfortable, they completely came around to them. So much so, they decided to go into business together. Together. They named the company Crocs, since crocodiles, like these shoes, can thrive in both land and water. Now, George was also an accomplished man in his own right. He'd had a rough childhood, but started his own lawn mowing business at 10 years old, went on to be a star student athlete with a college scholarship, and then went on to own more than 100 Domino's pizza franchises and served as an executive at the sandwich chain Quiznos. So, between these three friends, they had a reasonable amount of business experience. The only problem was none of them really knew anything about the shoe market. The first order of this new business was to create a model for distributing this strange Canadian shoe in America. Lyndon led the development of this plan while Scott worked on the product, and George put forward a sizable amount of investment money to get things started. They set up shop in an office in Boulder, Colorado, and ordered their first shipment of the product from their supplier. Then they began thinking how they were actually going to sell them. They figured at the very least, they knew that these shoes came in handy on a boat deck. So they headed to a Florida boat show in 2002, as they had a feeling that the novelty and uniqueness of the product would intrigue buyers enough to try them on, at which point they'd see how comfy and convenient they were. Their tactic was to literally throw the shoes at people passing by their booth, and when someone would call the shoes ugly, they would tell them to just try them on. This worked incredibly well. They reportedly sold around 200 pairs of Crocs at the boat show. What the Crocs co-founders didn't necessarily anticipate was the number of workers from other industries who felt that Crocs were perfect not only for the boat, but for hospitals, kitchens, restaurants, anywhere where workers were on their feet for hours at a time. At this point, the Crocs founders had no idea how big of a company this would become, but they were beginning to get a sense they'd hit both a cultural nerve and found a consumer niche that hadn't yet been tapped. Crocs continued to grow at a steady pace, despite some critics referring to it as an unfortunate fad. There were plenty who believed that a shoe like Crocs was simply a passing fashion trend doomed to eventually fail. Yet, it wasn't failing. Crocs sold 76,000 pairs of the shoes in 2003, and between 2005 and 2006, their revenue climbed 226%. One of the really savvy moves that the founders made was acquiring Foam Creations Incorporated, so they could have exclusive rights to the foam material called Croslite that Crocs were made of. Another savvy move was developing a unique style of distribution and restocking that was uncommon in footwear at the time. Instead of retailers having to buy Crocs in bulk and then discount the pairs they didn't sell, they could buy as few as 24 and then restock once they ran out. This lowered the risk for retailers and ensured that many stores of all different sizes ended up stocking their shoes. 
Even though many people didn't like Crocs, the fact they stood out a lot meant they got talked about a lot, and ultimately, that publicity proved to be very valuable. With demand for their shoes rising rapidly, in 2006, Crocs had its IPO, and they raised $239 million, which placed it as the highest initial public offering for footwear ever. This put its market value at a little over a billion dollars. Whilst all of this rapid growth brought in millions for the Crocs founders and their early investors, it also proved challenging to keep up with the demands of seemingly endless expansion. Linden commented how the breakneck pace of expansion took a toll on all of the founders, as they worked around the clock to keep growing the business. However, it seems that it was harder on some founders than others, as later in 2006, things got a little dark. Just a few months after the company went public, co-founder George Bodecker, the one who initially invited Linden on the boat trip that started it all, made an unusual call to his brother-in-law. According to his brother-in-law's police statement, George said to him, and I quote, I'm gonna bury you so deep that no one will ever find you. I'm going to slit your motherfucking throat. About 20 minutes later, George apparently showed up at his brother-in-law's office threatening to fight him. Now, why George went after his brother-in-law is not entirely clear, but there are multiple reports of very erratic behavior from the Crocs co-founder around this time, both in the office and out of it. After a string of controversial incidents, he was removed from the Crocs board of directors, which only made him more angry. You see, George is a complex character in the Crocs origin story. The company probably wouldn't exist without him and his passion and management of the company in the early years. However, as one former employee was later quoted saying, you don't want to mention the name George Bodecker in the office. It's a bad word at Crocs now. Crocs seemed to distance themselves from their co-founder as much as possible, especially since in 2012, he was confronted by police for allegedly driving under the influence of alcohol. He reportedly insisted his girlfriend had been driving the car, and that his girlfriend was pop star Taylor Swift. Despite the fact he was clearly not dating Taylor Swift, and nobody else was even in the car with him, he was just super wasted. Which certainly didn't make for a good luck for Crocs when all the headlines popped up about this. When George stepped down as the CEO of Crocs, the person who took his place was actually Lyndon's friend who'd let him crash on his couch back when he was at his lowest point. That was Ron Snyder, and Ron is credited with leading Crocs into a new era of success as CEO. During his initial years, Crocs went from carrying two models of its shoe to around 250. Revenue and stock values continued to climb, and Crocs expanded its international presence. They also began to acquire adjacent companies like Gibbets, which made charms you can attach to Crocs so that people can personalize their shoes. Crocs also established licensing agreements with the likes of Disney and the NBA. At this point, they seemed unstoppable. That was until 2007, when things began to take a turn. As with many other companies, the financial crisis of 2008 brought major bumps in the road for Crocs. Consumers weren't shopping and sales went down, bringing stocks with them. Crocs announced a projection of decreased revenue, and over the coming years, they hit employees with a number of layoffs and continued to struggle in the stock market. Then, in the middle of these financial troubles in 2008, a company called Select LLC came forward with accusations that Crocs violated a 1999 patent for a material extremely similar to Crocs' Cross Lite. On top of that, manufacturers of Crocs lookalikes said that Crocs was actually just a lookalike of an Italian shoe that existed well before Crocs, which Scott allegedly knew about. All this speculation that Crocs' design had been ripped off from somewhere else just sent their stock price stumbling further. And yet, Crocs is still here, and thriving right now. So how did they bring the infamously ugly shoe back from the brink? Before we get to the next chapter, I want to tell you about our video sponsor, Swagbucks. A great way to earn extra cash and gift cards in your spare time. With Swagbucks, you can earn cash rewards by playing mobile games, taking surveys, and even shopping online or in-store. For example, there are several websites you probably already buy from, but if you simply click on the websites via your Swagbucks account, you'll earn cash back. It's such a simple, easy way to make money online, so if you want to earn some extra cash yourself, just click my link in the description below to join for free. And once you sign up, you'll even get a free $10 bonus. So click the link below now, and thanks again to Swagbucks for sponsoring this video.
Rapid growth may seem great on the surface, but for Crocs, it was just the tip of an unsustainable iceberg. Overexpansion and an excessive inventory left them largely treading water, as Fast Company described it, from 2008 to 2018. But then suddenly, Croc stock began to bounce back. It was a combination of smart marketing and capitalizing on the fact that several celebrities, like actor Shia LaBeouf, had been photographed wearing their shoes. What's interesting is that at many points, Crocs did try different designs that weren't so ugly, as to appear to a wider customer base. But ultimately, they realized that their power actually might be in their polarization. No one is neutral on Crocs. You either love them or hate them. So Crocs began to push out a message of acceptance, individuality, and creativity. The Crocs CMO said that Crocs fans see themselves as bold and one of a kind. They tried to position it as Crocs wearers having a kind of cool, carefree attitude of not worrying what other people think. They then combined this messaging along with a number of strategic celebrity partnerships with the likes of Justin Bieber and Post Malone. There was even a collaboration with Kentucky Fried Chicken, including scented fried chicken chew charms that really smelled like chicken. Crocs became a cultural chameleon, able to adapt to a wide variety of partnerships from the sleek and high concept to the utterly bizarre. High fashion retailers and brands like Barney's and Balenciaga also picked up on the trend creating lines of custom platform Crocs that graced the runways of Paris and sold out instantly in stores. Basically, Crocs' strategy of aggressively pursuing collaborations was very deliberate, as they especially focused on collabs they knew would generate a lot of headlines by being surprising. Hearing Crocs have partnered with Cheerio Cereal or being worn by high-end fashion models provides endless free publicity. Another huge win for Crocs was, surprisingly, the pandemic. Whilst most apparel companies suffered in a pandemic economy, Crocs thrived. In fact, 2020 was their best year ever. Driven by a desire for comfort over style, sales surged to new heights and stock values rose 300%. It also helped that Crocs had already switched to prioritizing online sales and had closed down a lot of their expensive retail shops so they could focus more on e-commerce. In 2021, Crocs reported a record high revenue of $2.3 billion. Of course, as a footwear company, one of Crocs' biggest hurdles will always be relevance. As with any sort of fashion, there's a question of whether something is simply a passing trend or a true staple of global culture. But but Crocs have been around for about 20 years and is recognizable all over the world. Plus, they're seemingly making more money than ever, which is pretty impressive for a product that even the founders of the company thought was ugly. Now, at this point, you might say, sure, they've done well, but the Crocs founders already had some business experience and money to invest, so why don't you tell me about a business that started from absolutely nothing? And to that, I would say, good point. You should go and watch my mini movie on Louis Vuitton, how a homeless teen created the biggest fashion brand in the world. If you like this video, you will love this next one. Just click the thumbnail on screen now and I'll see you there. Cheers.